some of what I know for sure ain't so, I can give you six page numbers that, that have that, and I'm not gonna skip through and do it, I do it occasionally. But this one, uh, on 46, last paragraph ends with much. Count three lines above that. It says it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power which is God. What that says is, I'm not going to understand God. My sponsor says the teacup of my mind cannot contain the ocean of God. <laughs> So get out of the business of understanding God. When we talk about the God as you understand him, what we're saying is you don't have to believe what anybody else ever told you. We don't hear qualified they claim to be. That's what that means. You're not going to understand God. You're going to get a brain hernia trying. It will not work for you. I, I talked to somebody not too long ago who was trying to understand God. He said, do you understand God? I said, no, I quit trying years ago. That's not the assignment. That's not it. It's like I said before, the assignment is to try to make me his man, because I had that backwards. The other one on this page that is so powerful, the two best pieces of news I've ever gotten in my life are both in this book. The first one is here on page 46, five lines from the bottom. It says, we found that God does not make too hard terms for those who seek him. Let me translate that into Tennessee English for you. God ain't mad at me. Wow, that's some good news. That's not what I've been told. That is some good news. Because with an angry God, I very simply can't do step two. It is impossible. Uh, we're on a tight budget. We don't have a basket. We usually have an ASCIT basket. We're going to have an ASCIT hat because we didn't have a basket. And uh, our last session is going to be answering or I hate, I don't overpromise. We're going to have questions and dumb looks. We may or may not have answers. Um, I don't want to overpromise. But this is going to be right here. We're hoping you're going to put some questions in here, um, anything at all. Um, and uh, I think we'll, we'll break. Well, I, one more thing, then we'll break. One of those slogans I saw on the wall when I was new, it really upset me. It was the only one I was doing. It said, think, think, think. Man, did I have that covered. Think, 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 God, did I have that covered. And my sponsor explained to me this way. He said, no, no, you're misreading. What it says is think, think, think. What that means is that three thinks is the limit. <laughs> Whatever it is, you can think about it once. That's good. Twice, that's good, too. You can think about it the third time. When you thought about it the third time, you must lay it down. But if you were going to outthink it, you would have outthunk it in three thinks. If you go to the fourth thing, you got a problem with the first step. You're trying to manage it. Three thinks is the limit. God, that's helped me a lot. Well, uh, we're going to take a uh, 12 minute and four second break. I'll see you right back here. Thank you. <laughs> we're making this up as we go. The only thing we had planned was the first five minutes of the first session. We're going to make it up on the, I've done a lot of these and a lot of people, and they're more fun if we make them up at the breaks. So that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> Those who've been around for a while know that Bill Wilson was asked on a number of occasions. The difference in step six and seven between shortcomings and character defects, and he said, I just didn't want to use the same words over again. Here we have him on page 45 using the same single word six times in nine lines. Starting about six lines down, the needed power wasn't there. Human resources marshaled by the will were not sufficient. They felt orderly, lack of power was our dilemma. Had to find a power of which to leave it. Had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. Or in how to find this power. It's exactly what the book's about. Main object, enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. Six times in nine lines. My problem is not lack of motivation. It's not lack of education. It's not lack of information. My problem is lack of power. I simply didn't. I had the motivation. The nose pukers have a tendency. They, uh, they'll quit forever. <laughs> I, I don't think quitting forever is difficult. I've done it over 2,000 times. And the trick, if you're new, by the way, isn't to how to not start again. That's not what this is about. This is about how to not want to drink again, which is a very different thing. Page 57. Save for a few brief moments of temptation, the thought of drink has never returned. That's what I'm talking about. At such times, a great revulsion had risen up in him, seemingly could not drink. If he would, God had restored his sanity. My third sponsor was a guy named John. He picked up the nickname Rusty. At the end of his drinking, he was drinking mouthwash mixed with Kool-Aid, and he wet his pants so many times his zipper rusted shut. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And um, 
and we nicknamed him Rusty in honor of the zipper. He, uh, he loved his nickname, by the way. But Rusty said, in the history of planet Earth, no human has ever been put in an insane asylum for being insane, never, not once. They put us in there for acting insane. And none's ever been let out for being sane. They let us out for acting sane. So he said, on those days when you're crazy, if you don't act on it, they won't know. Don't tell them they're not ready. Tell one of us we're ready and we're not all crazy on the same day. I think that might be some of the best advice I've ever gotten in my life. Don't tell them. It says, what is but a miracle healing? Its elements are simple. Circumstances made him willing to believe. In my case, I worked my way into a hole I couldn't lie my way out of. He humbly offered himself to his maker. Then he didn't say, help me. He said, take me. Help me and take me are not the same prayer. We're going to talk about that again. Even so, as God restored us all to our right minds, to this man, the revelation was sudden. Some go to more slowly. Here's maybe the most powerful promise in the book. He has come to all who have honestly sought him. I like the analogy that God's kind of like the mother of a three-year-old playing hide and seek with her child. Where does she hide? She hides where the child can find her. This is my heavenly parent. Where does he hide? That's right. Uh, on, on James' uh, thing he talked about earlier about some of what I know for sure ain't so, I went to an old timer one time and I said, you guys said by the time I was sober a year, my sleeping patterns have not, have, would level out. And I'm sober just under a year and I haven't. I don't sleep. And he said, I just watched you drink two big cups of coffee here at 8 o'clock at night at an AA meeting. And I said, caffeine doesn't affect me. And he said, if you drink a quart of scotch every day and smoke six or eight joints, it won't. And I said, oh. <laughs> and I've been sleeping since, uh, not that night. I, I wonder how he knew the number of joints. Anyway. <laughs> and. And I knew to the core of my soul I could have passed a lie detector that caffeine did not affect me. And I wonder today how many things I know for absolute sure and certain are actually incorrect. I wonder how many. And today, I'm not trying to defend them. I'm trying to find them. I'm going to talk about one more thing, and I'm going to try to hand it over to James, but I've got black cord fever. I love a microphone. Um, <clears throat> if you're new, this one might save your life. I had about six months, and I went to my sponsor. I said, man, I'm having these dreams. Like, I got the dream where I'm at the corner of the bar, and my buddy's drinking a Coke, and I'm drinking a beer, and we're eye contact, and I get the beer, my mistake, and I have a sip, and I wake up, and I spend the rest of the night thinking, if that happens, do I have to start over? And I, you saw the Cheech and Chong movies, they a joint this big, takes two guys, hold up, I have that. I said, I'm having these dreams. And he said, you want to know what it means? I said, yes. He said, I'm going to tell you, when you wake up from one of those dreams, I'm going to tell you what it means. It means it's time to tinkle. <laughs> Don't take my word for it. You trot down the hall and check. <laughs> and then you get back in bed and have you a gratitude prayer. It was only a dream. That stuff was a big part of your life for a long time, and you're going to dream about it. I've had a drinking dream this week. I'm carrying a 40-year chip. All right? I drove for airplanes to the Air Force for five years. I got 2,500 hours of flying time. I still dream flying occasionally. I'm not going to the recruiter's office this afternoon. Don't worry about it. We're having them too. Quit trying to figure out what it means. Unless you have a PhD in the psychology of dream analysis, you ain't qualified. And what it means is it's time to tinkle. Don't take my word for it. Check. Thank you, Scott. James Brown, alcoholic. The, uh, I'm uh, <laughs> Glad to be here with you. You know, uh, we got we moved the ASCIT cap out there. If anybody, I want to bring this up before we get, before I say what I'm going to say. But there's there's a notepad there and some ink pens. And so, uh, uh, if you've got a question, please ask. This is the first word of the first step is we. And I promise you, this thing, it we the more we all participate, the better this is. You know what I mean? If I'm I am directly. For me, I know I can say, well, how, if you think I've done a good job, it's because you participated. I mean, I, if you don't participate, it's going to drag out. You know, it's like, a, it's like a, a lecture on Hebrew or something. You know what I mean? If you don't talk, it gets real dry. And so, so please participate. Ask If you've got a question on your mind, there's not a wrong question. We may not ever have a right answer, but there's definitely not a wrong question. I, I love them. It makes me, I, I don't know how many times we're, 
or uh, that that I've listened to your question or something or took something from you and and thought about it on a week and prayed about it and I have grown. I need you just as much as I need to be right here, you know. And th thank you for that. So, um, the uh, these old ideas, you know, and 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 I was one of these guys of the why do I have to have this power? Scott, uh, he was talking about it. He used this the word power so many times in one line, and and what all this insistence of needing this power. And, it, and it, what I and the book reminds me on one more time on page 43 it says once more it says the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink except in few rare cases neither he nor any other human being can, can provide such a defense his defense must come from a higher power that's just, it just says once more because they've repeated it for 43 pages up through here it, it mentions this idea in the doctor's opinion it says that that it has to be frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices the hey you better not do that do you remember the last time you know we were sitting up here earlier and scott said you know i think it'd be a good idea if you don't drink again you know and that that will not keep me sober i like to say that I, my my uh why my wife that i'm married to she left me just about as many times but she won she's persistent over me quitting drinking she left one more time after i quit the last time again and the last time it sounded like this i've got everything i need out of the house this is nine o'clock in the morning she got real good at it and uh because she did it a lot I, it's all, like i said i quit a lot she left a lot and uh she called me at 9 o'clock one morning and said, I've got everything out of the house I need. I'm walking to the Verizon Wireless to change, my, to change my phone number. If you show up to my work, you'll go to jail. Click. Because I'm a, I'm a talker. You know, just listen. That was my favorite words. Anybody had a favorite slogan before sobriety? You know, mine was just listen. Because I was fixing to sell it to you one more time on why I do what I do and why, why should you accept me, right? I need, to listen. I need you to listen to me one more time, right? And so that's where I, that, and, but I had no effective defense on this. I will tell you a reason that I, I swear I'll never do it again. I'll not go there. I won't hang out with them. I'll delete every name in my phone. I will do all, anything I can do to convince you. But here's the deal. I get restless. You're picking on me. I get a little irritable. And I, when, I'm, when I'm just discontented enough, then there's only one thing that gives me some contentment. And that was alcohol. But here's the deal, it's not even real. You know, the, in the doctor's opinion, and then I'm gonna move forward. I'm, I, I like to jump around. Uh, some, people say, too. some people say squirrels. I've, I, I work with a guy in recovery and, he, and sometimes we'll be talking about something and he'll, we'll, I'll jump way over here and he'll say, there's a shiny thing again. And uh, <laughs> he, he calls them shiny things. Because uh, yeah, we're truck drivers and we like things that sparkle. And, uh, and the, <laughs> Trying to limit some of the things that sparkle, but you know, shiny thing. We, it says they are restless, irritable, and discontent unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which takes from take, uh, which comes from taking a few drinks. It's not even real ease and comfort. It's not any. It's just a sense of it. It's not even real. It's just alcohol done for me. What I'm glad. I'm glad it did for me what it did, or I wouldn't be here. It kept me alive a very long time. Because without alcohol, I don't think I'd have made it. I sobered up at 20, 27 years old. I have the utmost respect for people that don't sober up until they're in their 40s or later. I know a guy that got sober when he was 68. I could not imagine that torture that long. At 27 years old, I was done. You know, and I come in here and that's why. My sponsor says, why is a management question? Step one, you're not in management. I'm sure y'all have all heard that. But, but the why of this power is because I don't have it. But here's the, here's the good news. I felt like when I got here, I was going to have to find this God. Even though I made this list, I was going to have to find this God that's out here somewhere. Right? I'm going to have to get out here and look. Here's the good news. I have my, it's natural for me. My whole life, I've been trying to fix the way I feel in here with an outside deal. And that's not how we do it. This is an inside job. And I, I'm going to prove it to you. Don't take my, don't take my word for it. On page 55, because on 45, it says lack of power, that's our dilemma, right? On 45, it says actually we are fooling ourselves. 55. Or 55, my bad. I'm, I'm a little dyslexic and alcoholic. And I like to make stuff up and page numbers too. Sorry. It says actually we're fooling ourselves for 
for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured, right? Separated from. It's like, like if I look through that painted glass hanging on the window, I'm not going to get a clear vision of what's going on outside. It's obscured, you know what I mean? I may see a vision of something, but it's not going to be really what it is. But it says it may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, and by worship of other things. But in some form or other, it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and this miraculous demonstration of this power in human lives are fact as, uh, facts as old as man himself. And, it's, uh, and so it says we have found the great reality, capital letters, right? Right? Mid-sentence. We have found great reality deep down within us. It's an inside job. This power is already here. It created me, right? It is already here. And so I don't have to go out there and believe in something out there. I, it's already in me. And the, the deal uh, with it is learning how to calm me down enough to hear that power, right? To hear that power. And today, like uh, one of my friends talks about in his meditation, and we, my home group's a meditation group, and we do a meditation followed by a literature topic. But he says in his meditation, what he listens to is the, what he tries to plug into is the hum. I'm like, the hum? And he said, if I get quiet enough, I can hear this hum. And he said, I just, I just focus in on the hum. And so for me, like I, I try to quieten my life. I want to be as close to God as I can get, right? And from my experience, the closest I'll ever get to God is when I'm right here with you, right? When I'm right here with you, when I'm with his children, right? And I, that is because my God has never, yours may have, so that I'm not... I'm just telling my experience. God has never poked me on the shoulder and said, hey, I got something I want to talk to you about. And verbal, you know, and, and it scared me to death if he did. I know things are getting serious. And uh, it's about like red uh, <laughs> letters in the mail with red letters, you, you know what I mean? The red writing on them, it's getting pretty serious. Better pay attention. Last final warning, right? And, uh, but uh, this God that I've got, when I'm with you, I connect. I always tell everybody, I got sober in the smoke room. When I got sober, they were, we could still smoke then. Back then, we could still smoke. And they would be something like this we'd go to, and we'd, or, or there'd be some speaker come in and talk, and we'd listen to them. And me and a couple guys, we'd go back outside, and we'd be smoking these cigarettes in this, inside in the smoke room, and we'd say, did you hear what that guy said? And I always, I, this, this spirit that's about us, it's like this gigantic wooden spoon. I come, when I was a little kid, I remember my parent, or my grandparents making all these nice dinners and stuff, and she had this big old wooden spoon, that, and she would stir this stuff up. And, and the guys that would talk about this book and share their experience on these steps are just like that spoon. He would stir something up in me, and it, and it gives me cold chills today, and, and it still does, and it would stir something up in me, and that spirit would come alive. And all of a sudden I would grow and we'd sit there and we'd smoke them cigarettes and we'd talk about it. And something would happen and I would change. And that's down in me, right? It's down in you. And that's what we're trying to plug into. It's, I don't want to look through stained glass anymore. I want a clear connection. And that's what, this is the, uh, this 12 steps is the, uh, in, in Alcoholics Anonymous is the only place I've ever found that has plugged me in. I'm active in other things, but it will take me to where I am connected right here, right now with that power. And, that, and, that, and I wanted to touch on that before we got talked about turning our will and our life over to this power. But I, 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 that's all about that connectedness with, between me and God. And it starts with me and you. So let me do just a couple of pieces here. Page three, uh, I'm going to talk some about some of the things I just plain misunderstood. And there's one on page three. Um, about two-thirds of the way down the page, my drinking assumed more serious proportions. Continuing all day almost every night, the remonstrances of my friends terminated in a, most of us will read row, and it's not it, it's row. Rhymes with cow, means quarrel or fight. It's a word we don't use. The Brits use it all the time. I got a friend in Scotland, I've heard him use it within the last month. Uh, so it's not a row. It makes no sense as a row. As a row, an argument or a quarrel, it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to throw that in. Page 25 has something that I think can be read two ways. Just about the dead center of the page. Well, the paragraph begins with the fact, the great fact, count down five lines, says the central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty. Our creators enter our hearts and lives in a way 
or has entered to our hearts and lives in a way. It reads both ways, and I think they're both correct. And uh, I like to look for stuff like that. Um, I think as far as stuff to dig out, I mean, I, I, I could do it for the rest of the day. Um, but I think let's go ahead on over to page 60. And um, it says, being convinced we're at step three. Convinced of what? A, B, and C. And I didn't do C, that God could and would if he were sought. That God we talked about, he could. Well, we've gotten down as powerful, so he could and would. Well, let's see. Eager to forgive, wants what's best for me. I say he would if he were sought, not found. It was explained to me that God is not lost. Therefore, it does not require to be found. But to simply seek means to put energy into an attempt to locate. That's what it means. Being convinced we're at step three, which is what we decided to turn our will and life over to God. Doesn't say over to the care of God, as it does in the short form of the step. My sponsor pointed out to me that step three is not where we turn our will and life over to God, over the care of God. If we could do that at step three, we would have a three-step program. It's where we decide to. The English verb to decide comes from the Latin verb scissere, which means to cut. The surgeon makes an incision, he cuts in. I make a decision, I cut away all the other options and act upon the one I have decided. So it's where we decide to, and the directions for accomplishing the decision are numbered four through 12. That that's what this whole thing is about. But it hinges on this decision, which we're gonna to come to in a couple of pages. It says the first requirement, aha, there are requirements. If there's a first, there must be more than one. We've convinced any life around self will can hardly be a success. On that basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody, even our motives are good. Collision, blam, bent metal, broken glass, blood, screaming, that's collision. It says even though our motives are good. Now, that, that confused me greatly. And I'll tell you a story. I used to be a commissioned salesman. And uh, the purchasing agent at my largest account was a personal friend of mine. I saw to that. Our wives were friends, were guests at each other's homes. I get a phone call from him one day, and he says, my wife just gave birth, and I'm, I know that's bad news. We're two months early. And he says, we're at Vanderbilt Hospital, and it ain't going good. You come pray over this child. I said, you know, I'm on the way. I hopped in my car, and I head to Vanderbilt Hospital doing what I've been hearing in meetings. People have been saying, check your motive, check your motive, check your motive. I'm checking my motive and I can't answer the question. Am I going to the hospital to pray with that child to bring a bunch of, to bring spiritual relief to this family or am I going to look good to him so I put some more money in my pocket? I cannot answer the question. He knows where I live. He's been a guest in my home in less than a month. I got about 15 minutes between my house and Vanderbilt Hospital and he knows that. And I pulled into the parking place and I can't answer the question. And I went to the source, you believe what you like, I believe what I'm about to tell you. I've, I've heard other people fail to describe what I'm about to fail to describe. But I went to the source, I said, God, I think I need an answer and I think I need one right now. And the next thing I got was, I did not hear his voice, but it was a thought, but it was different. It was bigger, it was brighter. It had a ring to it, it was in bold print. It was just different of the thought. And the thought was, does going into a hospital to pray over a sick child violate any of your principles? No. Then go ahead and do it. There are no wrong reasons for doing the right thing. No wrong reasons for doing the right thing. And that was where I got it. Motive doesn't matter at all. It's principle. That's why step 12 is not saying have good motives in all our affairs but to practice these principles in our affairs. Principle always trumps motive, always. Cliff Roach, if you don't know that name, get one of his talks. The Cliffer was one of the best we'll ever have. He said the 12 traditions are a set of principles designed to protect A from my very best motives. I think good motives are the most evil thing that's ever come to planet Earth, far and away. This moment, there's a man in Moscow, Russia, who believes he had a good motive for starting a war and thousands of people dying. Adolf Hitler in the 1930s and 40s killed millions of people. He said his motive was to purify the race. He believed he had a good motive. I'm told that Al Capone was asked by a newspaper man one time why he was involved in the illegal activity. Capone said, I was just trying to get people the things they wanted. Al Capone had a good motive. I have to get out of the motive business. It's good to have good motive, I'm not against it, but I can't trust them. Cannot trust them. 
uh, I'm, I'm, I got a number of examples I could give on that. But what it comes down to, and this is kind of deep, but it means a lot to me. If I operate from motive, I'm trying to govern the outcome. Motive says I can do anything I need to do in the meantime, action-wise, to make it come out the way I know it should come out. So motive governs outcome irrespective of action. Motive says I can lie, cheat, steal to make it come out. Did you ever lie without a good motive? I never did. That's a perfect example of good motive. I can lie if I have a good motive. No, no. Principle governs action irrespective of outcome. We talk about turn it over to God. What do I turn over? The result. How do I do that? One, I stand today where he is. Two, operate within his principles. And then he handles the outcome. So principle always trumps motive. Not bad to have good motive. And I think probably the worst thing about good motive, and I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes, is that if I believe I have good motive and you oppose me, you have bad motive and you're clearly a bad person and, and you deserve for me to hate you, and I do. And I have just described the political climate in my country today. And I've got to get out of the motive business. And I've got to quit believing i got a good one, because if I do, it puts me in a position to hate you, thinking you've got a bad one. And that's not what's going on. That is not what's going on. Did I, uh, did I muddy the water up enough? You want to take it from there? We can't. You don't seem eager. We're good. OK. I have a good motive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Here in the book, you know, you, you know, this AA is hard on a guy like me. You know, you, you come in here, you find out you can't drink. So you're not telling me good news. I'm going to have to believe in this power. Well, that's, there's some good news there that there's power that loves me enough to, to take me out of this thing. And, but then we get over here to about this stage of, the, of, of this place in the book and you start calling me names. You know, you start calling me names and, and, and it says, our, on the bottom of 61, it says, our actor is self-centered and egocentric. It's like, huh. I thought we was just trying to get well. You know, why you gotta, and, and, and it says, as people like to call it nowadays, right? And then on, on the top of the next, next page, <laughs> it says, um, selfish dash self-centeredness. You know, you start talking about this, and it's like, I thought you was going to show me how to do something, and then you're immediately calling me names, you know, and it's, and it's confusing to me, but then, but because I've never looked at me. I've never looked at me, and y'all hit me with it square in the face, and, it, and I never, if, if it wasn't for the 12 steps, I, 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 I belong to a, a, group, a bigger group of people that probably need some of this in their life, you know, that's seeking God. But they don't, you know, that, that this self-survey of, of, of would, be, would be real good. But that dash in there is important for me. And this self, selfishness dash self-centeredness. For me, when I, for, that selfishness is when I'm just so self avoid I want what I want when I want it right now. Right now. And I don't think about how it's going to affect you. I don't think how it's going to affect them. But then that self-centeredness is when I think you, you are thinking about me or you're making decisions that has something to, me, to do with me. I think that I'm in your thoughts all the time. And, it can, and, and, and I will think because you made a decision, it affects me. I read something the other day, and it, uh, it, come, it comes back to this. And it's something that and it, cause it, it says in here, it says, we think uh, this is the root of our troubles, driven by a hundred uh, forms of fear. Right? Self delusion, delusion self seeking, and self pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. But this hundred forms of fear. I read something the other day and it talks about one of my fears when I got here that I found out was abandonment, right? And I always felt, I was worried about that you wouldn't like me or you would leave me or whatever this was. What was what's this going to look like? And what I read in this is when, say, say we have a disagreement. That feeling that I get when we disagree, I've never been able to disagree with anybody because I'm so self-centered, self, so self-seeking. And, and so if I disagreed with you, I'd just have to let, let you go. I couldn't add you to my life anymore if, if we disagreed. And because it gave me a feeling, this uneasy, uneasing feeling, you know. And I read something the other day that said that this anytime I have that abandonment thing or, or a disagreement with somebody, that feeling I get is not a result of what's going on. It's a result of I feel that, that God's love has left me because we're so connected to each other. 
And that feeling is from you, you walk, stepping out in that, that hole there. And I thought, wow. So now I can disagree with somebody and I not have that. Because I, I know that God still loves me. I know they still love me. You know, and that feeling of, of being separate from, I, is, is, it's amazing that I don't have to have that. Now, I may still have that. Uh, uh, but it was amazing to me that I, uh, I'm, I've been so based on you flip this, you get this, so, much, so physical, you know, that I, don't, I forget that there's more than that going on. But I want to be connected to y'all, you know. But it says, um, sometimes they hurt us. Right? Sometimes you do things that hurt me. And I always thought you was doing it just to me. I never really realized that you're just doing it. You know? I'm so self-centered. This self-sufficient stuff. It says, um, um, so our troubles we think are basically on our, of our own making. That is the good news that this book carries. If it's them, I'm screwed. If it really is you and how you treat me and what's going on, I'm screwed. I've never really looked at my part. I've always blamed you for everything I got. If you had them in, my, in your life, you would drink too. If you was married to her, you're right, fill the blank. And I always blamed you, but it's not you. My sponsor used to, he always had me read in 86 to 88 and when I was brand new in sobriety. And it seemed like daily, he would have me read page 90 to 92, right? In the 12 and 12. He was always saying, well, you need to read the, you know, and it's because and, it was it, and it's, it's just the, the first of it says anytime I'm disturbed. I seem to be disturbed a lot when I was brand new. And 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 he would all and he always said, when are you going to stop fighting it? And I'm like, who's fighting what? You know, it's like, you know, golly, you know, and, and I was just so burned up because I'm not drinking anymore. I don't have what took that away from me. Right. And I don't know how to walk around. And so I'd walk around all burned up, and he would use this page, page 90 in, in the 12 and 12, and he would make me read this every day. I could almost, at one time, I could quote it to you. And it's been a lot, I'm getting, I would like to think that I'm getting a little better because I'm trying to look at my, myself, you know. But I, this is the good news, this looking at myself, you know. And now, now he puts a little emphasis on this, Wilson, in his writing. He says, they arise out of ourselves, talking about our basic troubles. And the alcoholic is an extreme example of self will run right. I don't think so. I don't either. I don't either. But an extreme example of self will run right. Now, what if you think about that? Like the self will run right. What would that look like? Now, I would. I, I want you to think that my self will would be a little bit real, real easy going. But it's, when you think about a right, and we've had some rights in this this country in the, over the last you know decade or whatever, and you think about that, it's total chaos. Right? You know, in total chaos. And, 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 and that, that's what happens when you tell me something I don't want to hear. In, my, in between my ears, it looks just like what's happened in the streets that we've all seen riding. You tell me something I don't agree with, you tell me something I don't want to hear, that happens between my ears. It's just total chaos. All, all crap breaks loose, right? Self will run right. Now here's the kicker. It says, though he usually doesn't think so. That can happen to me right here. I can, ha I can have this self-will run right in my mind because you said something I didn't agree in, and you'd say, why are you fighting it? And I'd say, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. You know, no, usually, though he usually doesn't think so. Now here it says, um, above everything. Above everything. I wonder if what does a, that I include? Wonder if that's important. Yeah, I, I would think so. But what, does that, what is everything? Above everything. Seems, seems like a lot, right? Above everything, right? Um, we must be rid of this selfishness. Seems pretty important, right? Must be rid of this selfishness. We're talking about getting well. He says we must, if that's not enough, we must or it kills us. Here's the good news. God makes that possible. And from my experience, it's like, I love hearing somebody say, I've been working on self. <laughs> you know, like, how's that going for you? Because when I try to not be selfish, I don't like you. You know what I mean? I, I try, I'm going to get in this relationship this time, and I'm not going to be selfish. It's going to be all about you until you don't do something I want you to do. And then I'm all bent out of shape again, right? I cannot work on me. But my experience is this. When I take this third step and I turn my will and my life over, then God t works on that with me, Right? I love, in this next paragraph, it says, this is the how and why. 
First of all, we had to quit playing God. Now, I would have told you I wasn't playing God, like it says, though he usually doesn't think so. But there's, if, you at, if I really am honest, up until finding this literature and up until finding the sponsor and all this, every decision I ever made until, until that day I broke that phone over that steering wheel was my decision. You didn't have any, I might have, I, I like to entertain you every once in a while, and I'd say, hey, what do you think about this? You know, and then I'd go do it my way anyway. You know, I, I, I train people at work in doing what I do, and, and, and I, one of the things I tell them is if you're gonna ask me how I do it, please don't ask four or five more, because all, every one of us has got a way that works and it's all different. You know, do yourself a favor and, and only ask one, right? And, but nobody had ever had any, any say-so in my life except for me up to this. I was playing God. Nobody made a decision. Anybody relate? Right? So that's good. That's good. It says it doesn't work. Obviously, look around. <laughs> We're in here talking about not doing it, right? It says next we decided that hereafter in the drama life, God was going to be the director. It tells me right there his position, right? He is the principal. We are his agent, right? Now, this agent idea. I love this because don't we all, let's just be real, don't we all like power? Every human being likes power. I want to be in control of something, right? I don't know about you, but control is a major defect in my life, so they tell me. And so, I'm not sure I agree, but they tell me. And so, But this idea of an agent, I, I've, got all, I've got insurance. That's a really big deal for a guy like me to have insurance. You know, that's, that was a blessing of this program, but I got insurance at Farm Bureau, we'll just say. And, I have an insurance agent. That agent can write me anything that that, that that agency has the power to do. That agent can do, do for me what that, but he isn't Farm Bureau. He's an agent. He's someone that has been given power to represent something bigger, right? Now, if I think about that on this business of me being his guy, that God being the director, he is the principal, I am his agent. That means I have been given access to the power to represent something bigger than me. That's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big deal. Page 132, and then I'm, I'm gonna let Scott touch on all this because I know he's got a lot good with it. I love on page 132. I'm gonna be at the bottom of the page, the paragraph that says, so we think cheerfulness and laughter makes for usefulness. Y'all see that? Outsiders are sometimes shocked when we burst into merriment over a seemingly tragic experience out of the past. But why shouldn't we laugh? It says, we have recovered, and we have been given what? The power. The power to help others. What an amazing thing here. This is, a, this is so powerful, this part of this book. This come alive for me when I, when, I, when I was going through this process, when it was described to me that I'm, I have been given power, right? Because that's what I've always wanted. But it's not power to run my life. It's power to carry the message so that you may be free. What amazing, and if you, if you, if, if you want to, ex I, I want you to experience this, what an amazing thing it is to be able to be able to, to carry this message, something that's freed me from that and become God's agent. Now it isn't always in work, it's, it's daily, it's right now, right? This, what, how am I acting? Well, how would God want me to act in this? How would he want, how would he want me to be a husband? I'm, a, I'm many things today, I'm a husband, I'm a, I'm a dad, which is amazing. I'm an, I'm an employee. I'm a co-worker. I'm doing all this. How would God want me to act? Like Scott said, every time I turn a blinker on and let somebody in, it's a spiritual experience. I, I, I drive for a living. I'm on the roads every, every day. And, and it is an amazing, I get all, I know it's hard to believe, but I get many opportunities to be God's agent. You know, because I'm driving a really big vehicle, and obviously you think I'm in your way. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I get an awesome opportunity to, every day to not run somebody over. And uh, that, because <laughs> if I was practicing self, I would not be employed right now because somebody had been off in the bushes, right? And what a beautiful thing it is to be this, right? I'm going to let you have it. <laughs> Thank you, James. Um, Page 61, um, I'm gonna replow a little bit of what he did, but I'm gonna dig out a couple of pieces. Two thirds of the way down page 61, you'll see, is he not two lines in a row? The second one says, is he not a victim of the delusion that he can rest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well? 
A delusion is a psychotic belief or a false belief. Rest means to take by tugging and pulling. In Tennessee English, what that says is, I'm so insane, I think if I can get what I want, it will make me happy. What I have failed to notice is the tens of thousands of times I'd gotten what I wanted was not rendered happy. There's nothing out there I can achieve, acquire, or attain that will make me happy. Bring me pleasure for a limited period of time? Absolutely. Happy? No. Page eight in Bill's story. He covers this so beautifully. Um, paragraph begins near the bottom page, near the end. If you count up about five lines, it says, I was soon to be catapulted to what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. <laughs> Einstein said the four dimensions were width, depth, height, and time. And the time I get catapulted into is right here, right now, between the claps, right here, right now. A place as an alcoholic I rarely visit. <laughs> My mind is off in the past reliving victories, some of which may have actually happened. Mm -hmm. Or I'm off in the future trying to figure it all out. What if this and what if the other and plan A and plan B and what if I find out and I'm never right here, right now, which is where all the action is. My mind could learn a lot from my feet. My feet never go into the past. They never go into the future. They stay right here, right now. My mind could learn a lot from that. Um, <clears throat> but Bill goes on in the next sentence to describe this fourth dimension in his own terms. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness, and the way of life that's incredibly more wonderful as time passes, happiness. I get that. Aristotle said what everyone wants is to be happy, and I want that for myself. Absolutely. Peace. Yes, I want that for myself, too. I want to be calm and collected and comfortable and peaceful in here, and I want that for me. Useful? What is usefulness doing on the list? That's for them. No, it isn't. It's for me. There is no direct route into happiness and peace. It is a side effect of being useful. I was diagnosed with cancer in my throat in June of 20. They took my teeth. They did so much radiation to my jaw that uh, my jawbone is now dead. It's still here, but it's dead. They killed it. Um, my throat has got so much scar tissue in it, and the epiglottis has buried the scar tissue that's not trustworthy. And I'm on a liquid diet for the rest of my life. I can either look at that or I can look at that I get to live the rest of my life. I've made my choice, okay? But the point is, on page 84, about the third line down, it says that feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. What in the world are uselessness and self-pity doing to you? How did they get matched up? And the answer I discovered was the path out of self-pity is to being useful. As I was going through the radiation and chemo, which is, believe me, it's rough as a stucco toilet seat, it's rough. As I was going through that, I got depressed a couple of times. How did I get out of it? I picked up the phone and called you. And I said, what's going on in your life? How can I make it better? How can I be of service? And I lifted my, it's just an astonishing thing. So the path into happiness is through being useful. I read this book quite a few times. Uh, I can give you six pages that say some of what I know for sure ain't so. I can give you six that say recovery's gonna be fun. Um, I'm about to do four pages on something else. But the single theme that runs wider and deeper in through this book than any other is be of service, help others. It's the same thing. I read the book one time from Roman numeral 11 through Dr. Bob's story looking very specifically for places that told me to help others or be of service. I counted 52. I found more since then. It's the single theme that runs wide. No matter what's going on in my life, my answer is to help you. It makes no sense. It also works every time. Um, page 62, um, selfishness of sinners that we think is the root of our troubles, driven by, driven! Not mildly bothered on rare occasion, driven by a hundred forms of fear. Fear is a deep concern. I may not get my will at some time in the future. Self-delusion, I believe my own BS. I've only got two brain cells left. One of them creates BS, the other one buys it. Self-seeking, I'm wide open after my own will. I ain't thinking about you at all. Self-pity, I didn't get what I wanted sometime in the past. Poor me. I'm not getting what I want right now. Poor me. Self-pity. Yeah. And my sponsor said, how would you like some good news? I said, well, I like good news. He said, how would you like the best news you're ever going to get in your life? I said, I'm open. Hit me with it. He said, so our troubles we think are basically of our own making. 
was that it? He said, that was it. I don't get it. He said, if the problem really is the cops, the courts, the judges, the Russians, the Chinese, your future ex-wife, her mother, and their lawyer, if those people really are the problem, you lose. The good news is that you, sir, are the problem. If you bring some willingness to this party, we can work on that. It meant not when he said it seemed to me like good news. I think it's one of the two best pieces of news I ever got. The other one's on 46 that God doesn't make two hard terms. Because the moment I become the problem, there's hope. If they had to move a quarter of an inch, I'm cooked. It's phenomenal. And the concept that I'm, is so powerful, we're gonna find it on page 53. Bill knew his audience. He had to keep telling us over and over again. <laughs> Second paragraph 53, when we became alcoholics crushed by a self-imposed crisis. Hmm, self-imposed crisis. Page 64, halfway down the page. First we saw search, search out the flaws in our makeup that caused our failure. Page 133. I don't remember the page count, the number. Five lines down, but it is clear that we made our own misery. God didn't do it. Four different places all say the same thing. I create my own trouble. Um, at the bottom of the page, this element, first of all, we had to quit playing God. Uh, do you know the first rule of horse cavalry? The first rule that they teach guys in horse cavalry? When the horse is dead, dismount. You rode in here on a dead horse, fella. <laughs> you might want to think about getting off. He said he had a quick playing guy. Had a guy named Bob Olson. If you don't know that name, get one of his talks. I was listening to him in the car on the way over here. I had him trapped in a hotel lobby one morning, and I was firing questions. I was getting doggone good answers, too. I think he got tired. He said, let me ask you a question. I said, oh, all right. St. Scott of Nashville is going to get a chance to impress Bob. Oh, yes, Bob, what's your question? Yeah. He said, at the bottom of page 62, you agreed to quit playing God. I said, yes. He said, how did you play God? I don't know. Well, I've added to his list. I don't know which of these are his or which are mine. Here are some of the ways I played God. I became angry when someone died. That's me saying I know who should die and how and when. Wow, is that playing God. Try to manage my own life and the lives around me. The closer you were to me, the harder I tried to manage your life. I judged people. I know that because I had a resentment. So the only way to get a resentment is to judge someone, find them guilty, be angry with them, and then feel that anger again. Is that feeling again of old anger, this resentment by definition? And to get that, I must have started by judging. I judge people. It's one of the ways I play God. I trusted my motive. We already talked about that. Principle always trumps motive. When I trust my motive, I'm playing God because I'm governing the outcome. I needed to know. I asked the question, why? Why is this? My sponsor said, why is a management question and you ain't in management? So all the why questions have the same answer. The answer is you don't need to know. And I hated that when he said it. Today, it's one of my cornerstones because I thought it was not knowing that made me crazy. Incorrect. It was needing to know that made me crazy. Mm -hmm. When I laid down the need to know, I got peaceful. From a position of peace, I began to know. But the knowing isn't worth near as much as the peace. So I asked the question, why? It's one of the ways I play God. I was sure everything I knew was correct. Anybody who disagreed with me was clearly a fool. That is not only playing God, it blocks my chance to learn anything. I lied, we already talked about that. That's me playing God, I'm governing the outcome. I worried. Worry is just low-grade atheism. Worry is how I tell God I'm absolutely certain he can't handle my future. That's some of the ways I played God just some. And then when I get a, a new guy to this point, um, we read, and next we decide that hereafter in this realm of life, God is going to be our director. He's a principal of his age. He's a father of his children. I say, have you made that decision? If you haven't, I'll give you some time. But if you have, I want to hear that back in the first person singular. And he will say, I have decided they're after in this drama life. God is going to be my director. He's the principal. I'm his agent. He's the father. I'm his child. And I will say, I think you have made a fabulous decision. And I want to make a deal with you, a pact. And the deal is that decision will stand unless you go insane. 
And if you go nuts and decide to change that decision, you'll change it formally with me or whoever's sponsoring you at the time. We have a deal and we shake on it. My third step decision has stood for 39 and a half years. My implementation is better on some days than others. I do not need to continue to make a decision. I've got a good one in place, so I don't need to keep doing it. It says, this idea was the keystone of the new internal arch, which the keystone in an arch is a strangely shaped one in the middle that makes all the rest of it work. In, in antiquity, they could not build an arch out of stone until they figured out the keystone. It's the one that makes it all work. So when we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer being all powerful. He provided what we needed if we kept close to him for warned us work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. Let me make an observation. In the middle of the facing page, it said above everything, we had to be rid of the selfishness. It sounds to me, through what I just read, that's already happening. So what happened in between? Twice I acknowledged that I can't fix me, I can't change myself. I acknowledged that I've been playing God, and with his help, I'll stop. And I made a decision to turn my will and life over to his care and have formally done so. And with those pieces in place, this thing I must have above everything is already happening. It's already happening. You want to take it from there? That's right. Um, I get excited around step three because I know if a guy's all all in, and I know if I'm all in with this, that like my life is radically going to change. You know, it, by my experience, when I like like you said, I, I've got a firm step three uh, that I that I took with a group of guys a long a long time ago, and and on my knees with them, when we said that prayer, I meant it. And but I made he, these guys made sure I knew what I was committing to before I did it. He wasn't trying to trying to say, hey, just do this halfway. You know, don't. We didn't use the fake it till you make it. We, we said. We said when we. It says clearly, when we sincerely took such a position. Since sincerely is pretty clear. You know, when I sincerely take that position, you know, I'm signing the dotted line here. I am in. I am all in. And I'm. It's easy for me to be an all in guy. When I was out there, I was all in. You know what I mean? Whatever. I'm in the middle. I'm not. They say when you're if if you're bad to fall out of the bed, sleep in the middle. You know I'm I'm in. When we when we sincerely took such a position, right? I want this above all else, but above what I thought I wanted, above what I think I deserve. There's a big one. What I think I deserve. You know above all that, right? I am all in with this. When we sincerely, all sorts of remarkable things follow, and it, it says we had a new employer being capital. I'm going to share an experience, uh, an experience about that. I believe I've had the same employer ever since I've made this decision. I, uh, in, in sobriety, I, I got this job and I was set. Like if you would have asked me if I was ever going anywhere, I would have said, no, why would I? I mean, they obviously, they recognized how important I was. I, I love that job, you know, and they, they I, I would have never went anywhere. I, I was number one there. As, I mean, it took a long time to find a group of people that would agree to this. You know what I mean? And I, I mean, I'm sailing right along. And then one, and, and I started getting this stirring in me that like this, I, I, God's going to take me to something else. And the day came where at this job that I was set at, you know, I was asked to do something that went against the principles that I practice, the 12 steps. They asked me to go against my principles to help them save some money. And I talked to my sponsor about it, and he said, well, remember we said we have a new employer. And that employer will not take you somewhere he don't want you to go, but you, and, and here's the deal that right here. It says there's a condition in this employer biz deal. It says if, sounds conditional. I'll show you another one of those ifs in the 12 and 12. One of my, I, I, I'm like, Scott, I have a lot of favorite. You're gonna hear me. If, it doesn't matter. At different times in my life, you're going to hear me say, this is my favorite thing in the book. It depends on where I'm at. And, uh, but uh, the, uh, in the forward, uh, in the 12 and 12, it says, AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, spiritual in their nature, which if practiced, if practiced, 
as a way of life. Can expel the obsession to drink. Isn't that what we're after? Free, right? Expel the obsession to drink and enable the suffer to become happily and usefully whole, right? In the third step, it says, if we kept close to him and perform his work well. I'm supposed to practice these principles we talk about in all of our affairs. This job asked me to go against them principles. And I took it home and I took it. In the ninth step, I learned to not make decisions that don't, if it's going to affect everybody, I involve them in it, you know. And I went home and I talked to my wife. I talked to my sponsor. And mostly important, I, I talked to God. And then I waited for him to tell me, to give me an answer. You know what I mean? I'm listening. I'm not just saying, hey, God, what do you think about this? You know, I'm, I'm listening. But I, I went back to that job and I left that job because I have a new employer and I want to stay close to him. That job, I always, one of the things I tell the guys I sponsor, if God ain't in it, I can't afford it. I cannot buy, I, he, I will buy it off more than I can handle in a heartbeat, especially if it has anything to do with ego. You, t you brag on me a little bit, I'm your guy. You know, and, and I will jump right in there. But I prayed about this. I have, a new, I have a new employer and I went with him, right? I went with him and I stayed with him. And so it says, and, and I'm gonna tell you this, it's been, a, it's, been a, it's been a pretty good ride, you know, it's been a pretty good ride. I had a good ride before. I think one of the worst things you can do for an alcoholic like me is get me good, right? Because I had a good thing going, but I'd have never seen the amazement of my creator if I'd have settled for that good. It was awesome there. But I mean, I had been blowed away. I left there on a God shot. It was kind of like jumping out of a plane with no parachute. You see me jump out of a plane, something's wrong. I'm scared of heights. I don't get out of more. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, but, it, but that's what that was. When I went to that employer and said, I'm leaving, that uh, I, I respectfully, I gave them a month notice and, and, and respectfully left. Y'all taught me that. Y'all taught me that. I don't have to say screw you by anymore. That's not in my vocabulary. And, and I left that job on a good term. And I'm telling you what, it was like jumping out of that plane with no parachute and letting God carry me to the ground. It was just unbelievable having this new employer, right? I want to stay close to that employer. My job is to practice these principles, right? There's some promises. I love the third step promises here. It says, established on such a footing, we become less and less interested in ourselves. I'm excited about that promise today. When I first read it, I thought, well, who's going to take care of me? You know, less and less interested in yourself. What the heck, right? It says, our little plans and our designs. Boy, did I not have a few plans and designs, right, for my life and your life. Anybody guilty of that? I know I am. Just listen. Remember, my favorite thing was just listen. I'm finna sell you something that was going to benefit me and probably hurt you. You know, that's the way it was. I was always singing the alcoholic theme song. If you don't know it, it's me, 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 me. <laughs> right. It says, uh, it says, more and more we become interested, interested in seeing what we can contribute to life. If I'm really honest up until I got sober, I would have told you a big lie about what I was contributing, about how you needed me. But I was contributing to me, you know? When they, when they, I, one of my friends got, got a charge for contributing to a minor, you know, and like a life, it's not funny, but I, I'm a sick guy. and. Uh, I, I, I've contributed to many minors, and but really only one. That's me because I'm minor in this world, right? And so, it, but uh, uh, this being being able to contribute to life, man, isn't that what we always wanted? Really secretly, when nobody around and nobody's asking, I just want to contribute, right, to life in itself. But if I wouldn't, I couldn't tell you that. I couldn't tell you that before that. I just want, you know, I want to make a difference while I'm here. Right? But I could have never told you that. Right? It says, as we felt a new power, a new power flow in. As we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we become conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. It says we were reborn. I'm not going to get political on you, but there was a, a everybody know who Barbara Bush was? She loved to talk. Anytime they interviewed her husband, they would ask him a question, and she would, she, like Scott, she loved a microphone, and she would answer it for him. And it was just, I, I don't know why, but I like watching her talk. I, remember, I was young then, and I like watching her. Well, her, her, uh, her son happens to have went through some stuff that we've went through and got sober, right? And they asked her about him. 
and she or asked her husband about him. And she, she leans up in the microphone in front of him and said, let me tell you something. We talk about people being reborn. She said, my son and his friends, they're reborn. They're the real reborn. It's one of the greatest interviews I ever seen. And I'm like, it gives me cold chills. Like, you people of Alcoholics Anonymous, you've showed me what being reborn was. From being a taker to a giver, it is unbelievable. It's all about stepping into the sunlight of right here, right now. You know, what can I add? And these are promises. I always get excited about this because I've watched people, and including myself, change radically. There was a, I sponsor a guy that used to work with Don, and I can remember Don calling, complaining about him, and him calling, complaining about Don. This guy is a daddy today. He's respected in his home. He just bought a farm. He's in like, it's not all about the stuff, but this guy was a, we really thought he was a goner, you know, and there was somebody going to kill him, and uh, <laughs> this is true. In the program, right? They were going to kill him. They come to me and said, "You need to take. You need to." And I'm like, "Whatever." And uh, they said, "Well, if, if if he don't change, we're going to kill him." You know. And uh, and I've watched his life be reborn, and other people in the program being reborn, and, to, and it's an amazing thing. You do not want to miss. I'm going to clear uh, the third step prayers right here. I want to point something out in this prayer, where it says, "God, I offer myself to you." Right? To build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. It says, relieve me of the bondage of self. Nowhere in this book, like after this point that I've found, we've asked God to relieve me of myself. But what I get by that is a freedom from alcohol. I'm not, I'm not relieved from alcohol. I'm free from alcohol. I'm not, I can go anywhere. Any, we've got beer on tap in my home group, you know? It makes the newcomer feel comfortable, and uh, <laughs> and uh, we really do. And 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 I can go anywhere and anyhow. I'm not hiding. Scott said something about a, a drinking dream. Like when I got here, all my memories, everything I had in my memory bank in my mind had something to do with alcohol. Like every any time I talked about going anywhere, whether it be on a vacation or at work or what, anywhere I went, anything I thought of had something to do with alcohol. And today, like all that's been transformed to where when, I, when you bring up a place or you bring up, bring up a vacation, I have these beautiful memories of me and my family doing this stuff together with no alcohol in it. And it's not because I'm hiding for it. In my experience, suppression brings on explosion. Yeah. You hide me from alcohol, I'm going to come out, right? <laughs> Swinging with booze in the hand. But what you've gave me is freedom. And it started with this prayer where it says, relieve me of the bondage of self, the bondage. And it's not necessarily a good bondage. Let's stay G here, right? Bondage of self. That I'm glad one person got that. That, uh, that. that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. Right? This this prayer to relieve me of myself, to, turn, to let me not be God anymore, to turn that over to where I've got new management. That's what this prayer is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there. We're probably about out of time. Do you got a few things to add to that? Yeah, just, just for a second or two, and we'll go to a break. <clears throat> to take the prayer apart, I think it's important to understand yeah. it. God, I offer myself to thee. Not help me, take me. Right. Help me and take me are not the same prayer. To build. Sometimes to build, we've got to tear down. My city is being built, and they're tearing stuff down everywhere. If you're new, there are going to be some tearing down. Some stuff you'd like to keep is leaving. It ain't coming back. Some things you don't like are coming. They're going to stay. It's a package deal. My will, God's will, pick one. Yeah, I tell you what, I don't want to work God too hard. Why don't I cover sex and money? He can get the rest. No, that's not the package. But there's going to be some tearing down so we can build. Relieve me of the bondage. Look up bondage, it means slavery. It means exactly slavery. I've been a slave to self. Yeah. And then take away my difficulties, and here we are about help somebody else. That's what it comes down to. And it says we thought before we did this, and it gives us the option to write our own prayer. I've seen some good ones. I have learned that uh, if my newcomer writes a prayer, I'm going to read it myself before we start trying to use it. A uh, songwriter I sponsored years ago, went nuts oh boy i'm gonna write one it was three stanzas it rhymed it was astonishing it left out the part about god being in charge which i thought was kind of important so i'm going to read it first before we do it and then if he wants to invite somebody else 
to the praying this third step. I'm good with that, but I will be there. Now, that's just what I do. Uh, my experience has been somewhere between the beginning of step two and the end of nine. Somewhere in there, something big happens. And someone who's already been there needs to be present. I don't know how many men I've had pray that prayer and dissolve in tears, and I wrap them in a blanket and hold them while they cry. His wife may not do, know to do that. His preacher may not know to do that. I do. But if he wants someone else to be there, I'm good with it. And then we pray the prayer, and that's step three. And uh, let's go ahead and take a, a break. Uh, how long a lunch break do we need, kids? 30 minutes. 30 minutes? Okay. Then uh, we'll start uh, at about 10 minutes till the next hour.